Really delighted to be here with you all. Uh, how many are here from the Diocese of Crookston? Raise your hand. Oh, great. It's great. It's wonderful to see. So grateful that uh, we're being hosted here across the river by our good neighbors in the Diocese of Fargo. And uh, really have the privilege of speaking to you today about this uh, National Eucharistic Revival that, the, that I feel like the Holy Spirit's asked me to lead. And I just really want to speak to you about uh, what it is and how you might live it, especially during these next three years. Of course, we chose the word revival on purpose. The word revival uh, calls to mind a fire and that we're trying to set a fire and that it's much more than just a program. We have received as Catholics the greatest gift in the world, the gift that our Lord gave us on the night before he died, the gift that carries forth his redemption throughout all of time. And this gift, this incredible gift of the Eucharist, wasn't meant just for us, but in fact for us to share. But we all know that we're living at a time where there's a crisis of faith, and in particular, a crisis of faith in the Eucharist. Monsignor Shea talked a little bit last night about this uh, Pew study that happened in 2019, which in some ways was the impetus for this Eucharistic revival. Bishop Robert Barron at the time was the chair of the Net Committee on Evangelization and Catechesis, and he proposed this idea even in January and February of 2020. I don't know if you can remember back to January and February of 2020 because of what happened in March of 2020, but what happened in March of 2020 made this revival even more important. And so, in fact, when the bishops first gathered after the crisis of COVID in November of 2020, this was when we began to talk about this Eucharistic revival. And then I was handed the baton in order to be able to plan it. And so I began my work as the chair of the Committee on Evangelization and Catechesis in November of 2020 and began to interview leaders from all across the country and people who work in parishes and schools and dioceses, evangelistic leaders, some of the speakers we have here today helped me as we put together this plan for a three-year revival. And we came up with this three-year revival, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about it. So the first year is the year that we're in. It began on June 19th. I hope many of you were at a Corpus Christi procession. We had a big one in Bemidji for the Diocese of Crookston. And many people here in Fargo, I know, attended various Corpus Christi processions that happened all across the country. And that was really the spiritual beginning of this three-year revival. And this first year is really focused on people like you. We want people like you who love the Eucharist, who in fact come to understand the Eucharist. We want you, as Monsignor Shea said so clearly last night, to deepen your own love for the Eucharist and to really begin to live a Eucharistic life. Because the revival depends upon the fire at the heart of the church. And you all are the heart of the church, and so we need you to be engaged in it. There's a great website that you can go to called eucharisticrevival.org, eucharisticrevival.org. That's the last time I'm going to say that. But you can go there, and you can sign up to receive a weekly newsletter. So we have a weekly newsletter that talks about the revival. I also hope you'll sign up to be a prayer partner. We already have 10,000 prayer partners across the country, people who've dead, said they're willing to dedicate an hour, a holy hour once a week or go to Mass an extra time once a week in order to pray for this Eucharistic revival across the country. The second year is really focused on parishes. Monsignor Shea mentioned this last night too, but one of the sad things about the studies that we've done is that it shows that a number of, a high percentage of people, perhaps as high as 25 or 30 percent of the people who sit in the pews even every Sunday don't fully understand the gift of the Eucharist and the church's teaching on the Eucharist. And so in this parish year, we're going to really invite parishes to help each other, especially those people who don't fully understand, to grow in their understanding of the Eucharist. And we'll be providing small group materials, other materials for the parishes, all, of course, through our website, eucharisticrevival.org. Darn, I said I wasn't going to say that again. <laughs> then uh, the big event that will really mark this, con con this revival is the Eucharistic Congress, which is going to happen in July of 2024. So please mark your calendars for July 17 to 21, 2024. You're going to want to go to Indianapolis for this event. Indianapolis is within one day's drive of half of the country, and so that's, that includes us. It's less than a day's drive for us. 
And really, we expect this to be an event that we haven't seen in the country for almost 50 years. The last time we had a, a Eucharistic Congress of this size, it was an International Eucharistic Congress in Philadelphia in 1976. And that day, a, a man named uh, Cardinal Carol Wojtyla was on the stage next to a woman named uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And so uh, we, we expect this to be a life-changing event, especially for all of you, and really hope that you'll be able to make the sacrifice to come. An exciting part about this National Eucharistic Congress is that we're going to do a National Eucharistic Procession. What do I mean? Well, actually, we're going to do four processions. So we're going to walk the Blessed Sacrament across our country from the four ends of the country. And we're going to end at Indianapolis. So we're going to begin at the tomb of St. Junipero Serra in Carmel, California. And we're going to begin at the tomb of Blessed Michael McGivney in Connecticut. And we're going to begin at, in, in, at Corpus Christi in Texas, perhaps even south of their Diocese of Brownsville, right? And then we're also going to begin in the north. And we're going to begin at the headwaters of the Mississippi in Lake Itasca State Park, right in the Diocese of Crookston, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and we have priests. We're going to invite young people, whoever wants to, to walk with Jesus across the country. This is going to take months, right? Some people might walk for a week or a month. I'm going to walk the first week from Lake Itasca going south, right? But we're going to process the Blessed Sacrament to Indianapolis in these four uh, processions forming across our, across our country and really praying and interceding for our country. So I hope that you'll plan to join us for part of that procession on your way to Indianapolis. The last year actually begins in Indianapolis, and this is really important because this is the missionary year. We want to equip and engage people like you to teach you how to find ways to reach out to those people you know who are away from the church or maybe never experienced the church. How do I begin to share my faith with them and invite them back to the Eucharist? I want to talk next about why this is so important today. I don't think I have to tell you that we live in a world in crisis. And this is clear to anyone who's watching the world with Christian eyes, right? From the international scene where we have wars happening across the world to the struggle for the soul of the family in our country. There's a struggle happening, especially in our country, as we see for the hearts and souls of young people and family and strong cultural forces that are pushing against what we know the Lord would want for our young people and for our families. And this struggle is dramatically affecting the church. In other words, the church herself is feeling the effects of this struggle and is hurting from this struggle. And so how do we respond to this crisis? Some, some months ago, somebody sent me the encyclical letter of Pope Leo XIII. And this is a letter that he wrote on the Eucharist. And it was written in 1902. You might remember Pope, letter, pope Leo XIII was the, the pope who had a sense from the Lord that the 20th century would be one of great difficulty and struggle where the enemy would have a lot of power. And he was right about that in the 20th century. And he was the one who commanded that the prayer for St. Michael be said after every mass across the whole church in order to help defend the church. Pope Leo XIII, at the end of his life, he writes a letter on the Eucharist. And he says in this letter on the Eucharist, he says, I could focus on many things. There are lots of problems I could speak about in the world. But actually, I want to focus the church on what is the heart of the church, the center of the church. Because as we are strengthened in our heart, in our center, we'll be able to stand and even witness to the world in which we live. As soon as I read that, I thought to myself, oh, that's why the Holy Spirit wants a Eucharistic revival today. Because the Holy Spirit knows that the church herself needs to be strengthened in her heart. And the heart of the church is the Eucharist. And if we're strengthened in our heart, then we'll be able to stand against the struggles and the difficulties of the world that we, that we live in. To understand this, I, I want to point out a, a, a paradigm, I call it, of St. John Paul II. And I think this is a really important way to understand your Christian life. And it's these simple words, relationship, identity, and mission. Now, the order of these words is really important. If we get the order wrong, we can actually end up going far from the Lord. 
Because the first thing in life that we were made for is relationship. You were made to live in relationship with the Trinity forever. This is what you were made for. You are a relational being. It's what it means to be a person. I'm capable of living in relationship, right? And you were made for this relationship of love with God forever. And when you live in that relationship with love, then you know who you are. Who are you? Well, you're a son or a daughter of God. You're the beloved for whom Jesus gave his life, right? And when we live in that relationship, I know who I am. And then it's much easier to know what I should do and how I should do it. You see this, by the way, in people who come to understand how much they're loved. They, they find it much easier to stand against the temptations and trials of the world because they know who they are. And always, in fact, the world wants to tempt us to take our identity from what we do, not from who we are. Of course, this is even possible in the church, right? We can pat ourselves on the back because we had a thousand people come to a conference. We did something great, but that's actually not what's most important. What's most important is who we are. And if we live who we are, then the Lord will in fact use us for his mission in incredible ways. But in fact, we live in a world where all the focus is on what you do and the importance of what we do. And we tend to take our identity from that, which allows the enemy to draw us into all kinds of things that we shouldn't be drawn into. And so at the heart of our faith is this relationship. I always like to quote this quote, which is, this is Pope Francis quoting Pope Benedict. And Pope Francis says this, I never tire of repeating those words of Benedict the 16th, which take us to the very heart of the gospel. Being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. Even in the living of my Christian life, I can get the focus wrong. I can focus on all the things I'm doing for God, all the rules that I'm keeping, and I can forget that this is fundamentally about a relationship with love. The rules are simply there to draw me deeper into love with God. This is the point of the Eucharist. Vatican II makes this profound statement. I always like to quote it. The other sacraments, as well as every other ministry of the church, and every work of the apostolate are tied together with the Eucharist and directed toward it. Everything we do as the church, we're feeding the poor, we're teaching in our schools, we're evangelizing, we're trying to witness to God's, to the gift of life. All these things are actually tied together with the Eucharist because we receive the strength to do them from the Eucharist and we're intending to bring everybody back to the Eucharist. The purpose of the church is to bring us the Eucharist, which is Christ himself. And our goal is to bring people to the Eucharist. It's why we feed the poor, because we want them to ultimately come and see Christ in the Eucharist, right? In this way, another way of saying is, it's all about relationship, because the Eucharist is the place where I discover who I am. And what does the Eucharist teach me about who I am? It really teaches me two things, that I'm the bride of Christ and the body of Christ. What do I mean by that? I am God's beloved. This is really important to see, and it's contained right at the heart of the Eucharist, right? Right at the heart of those words. This is my body given for you. Not for everyone, for you. This is my blood poured out for you. Or as St. Paul said when he described his own experience of faith, he said, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He didn't say us, right? In the Eucharist, I'm invited together with my brothers and sisters to this very personal encounter. Pope Francis spoke about this in his letter on the liturgy last summer. He said this, we may not be even aware of it, but every time we go to Mass, the first reason is that we are drawn there by his desire for us. 
Indeed, every reception of communion, the body and blood of Christ, was already desired by him in the Last Supper. Do you ever think about that when you're coming to communion? That Jesus is desiring you to come? He's longing for you to come? He's waiting for you to come? Why? Because he wants to be one with you. And there's no more way to him closer to become one with you than through this gift of the Eucharist. Of course, really connected to this point is the church's teaching on the truth of the real presence in the Eucharist. And of course, when we speak about what happens in the Eucharist, we speak about this miracle we call transubstantiation. What do we mean by that? It's important to understand, actually, because the Pew Forum might call you and you get a study, and I want you to be able to give the right answer. <laughs> no, it's important to understand because it puts in relationship. There's an actual change in the bread and wine. And the bread and wine are changed to the point that there's no more bread and wine there. What is there? What is there is what Jesus says is there. This is my body. This is my blood. You see, Jesus is God, and his word is true. And the one who was able to create everything out of nothing, the one who was able to create wine out of water, by his very word, he changes the substance, the essence of the bread and wine into his body and blood. Of course, the appearances don't change. The properties don't change. But in fact, what it is changes. And God himself comes to us through this, which means we can have a real encounter with God. I love this uh, phrase from St. Thomas's uh, him to the Eucharist, right? Seeing, touching, tasting are in thee deceived. So my senses, in this case, they don't reveal to me what's actually here. What says trusty hearing, it shall be believed. What God's son has told me, take for truth I do. Truth himself speaks truly, or there's nothing true. Truth himself speaks truly, or there's nothing true. The point is this allows for us to have a real encounter with the living Jesus. Again, let me quote from Pope Francis from his letter this summer. The liturgy guarantees for us the possibility of such an encounter. For us, a vague memory of the Last Supper would do no good. We need to be present at that supper, to be able to hear his voice, to eat his body, to drink his blood. We need him, the truth of him. In the Eucharist and in all the other sacraments, we are guaranteed the possibility of encountering the Lord Jesus and of having the power of his paschal mystery reach us. You see, this is really important because it's the encounter with Jesus as a real living person that changes us. Think about all the changes that happened in the Gospels when somebody really met who Jesus was, right? Like St. Peter when he said, Leave me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Why did he say that? Because when he saw the great cage of fish, he knew this was God before him. And because of the Eucharist being present with us, because God answered the cry of the hearts, remember the disciples on the road to Emmaus when they were walking with Jesus, but they didn't recognize him, and they said to him, stay with us. And then he came in, and he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Because he does stay with us in the Blessed Sacrament for all eternity. And what this means is that when I receive him, he comes to live in me. He comes to, be, to change me into himself. And this is really the other thing that is revealed when I receive the Eucharist, which is I am the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. What do I mean by that? I mean that God actually comes to live in me and that he wants to live through me into the world. Jesus has no other body but yours. I always love this quote of St. Teresa of, of Avila. Christ has now no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks with compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good 
Yours are the hand through which he blesses all the world. Why does that happen? Because through baptism, I have been grafted into Christ. And through the Eucharist, I am daily or weekly, whenever I receive him, I'm more and more transformed into Christ. So that I'm called to be his presence. So uh, just as it was spoken about in the homily this morning, right? When Moses came down from the mountain, there was a glow about him. People saw the effect. Do people see the effect of the fact that I receive Holy Communion? That he lives in me? In the way that I treat them, in the way that I'm patient with them, in the way that I speak about him, does it affect people? Really, this is... uh, part of the transformation that the Lord wants to do in us through this Eucharistic revival. But I want to speak about a way I think we're called to live this Eucharistic revival even deeper. When Senior Shea spoke last night uh, about the bad news, and he talked about this fact that in many ways we're all impacted by the culture in which we live, and that we tend to see our lives and our world through the lens of the culture in which we live. And what I want to say is this, if you're going to really be a Eucharistic missionary, as we're called to be, if I'm going to really live a Eucharistic life, I have to see my life in light of the Eucharist, what the Eucharist is. I have to allow the Eucharist to transform the way that I live my life. And so what I want to do is speak about how this happens. What will happen to you? If you really surrender your life to Jesus in the Eucharist. And how will he call you to live? And it really brings us in a certain way to what is the heart of the Eucharist. You know, uh, the, the Pew study did a study on people's belief in the real presence. But I bet if you did a study on people who could tell you, answer this question. Tell me, why is it important that the Mass is a sacrifice? I bet you we'd find even fewer people able to answer that question. Because this dimension of the Eucharist, which is right at the heart of what it is, a sacrificial life, is not understood by many people. And we need to understand it and live it better. So um, what happens is this. The encounter with Jesus that I'm speaking about the Eucharist is not the end of my discipleship story. I meet Jesus in the Eucharist. I receive him in the Eucharist. What's supposed to happen is that my life becomes to be lived like Jesus in the Eucharist. In other words, I learn to make my life a sacrifice or a gift. The way Jesus has made his life a sacrifice or a gift for me. Again, this is, this is right from the Second Vatican Council, right? Right? The most blessed Eucharist contains the entire spiritual wealth or boon of the church. That is Christ himself, our Pasch, our living bread. By the action of the Holy Spirit, through his very flesh, vital and vitalizing. And what does he do? He gives life to men who are thus invited and encouraged to offer themselves, their labors, and all created things to him. They're invited to learn to make an offering of themselves. Let me begin with a little explanation of this, uh, a practical explanation. So um, I had the, the privilege, as was said in the bio before, to, to live and study in Rome from 2002 until 2006. And so if you know your history well, then you know that I got to live in Rome when St. John Paul II died and when Pope Benedict was elected. And I was in St. Peter's Square for both of those events, one of the great privileges of my life. And I had, of course, met St. John Paul II at World Youth Day in 1993. Of course, he didn't meet me, but I met him, right? <laughs> I was just one of a million people in the crowd, but, but my life was changed by him. And when I met him, I knew that I wanted to study and follow him as much as I could because he so inspired my, my vocation. It was right before I entered seminary. And so when I moved to Rome, he was still the Pope. And Of course, the Pope says Mass, you know, in St. Peter's Square and at other events. And so I just made it a point to go to every possible Mass that I could for St. John Paul II while I was living there. And if you're a priest and you're studying Rome, you can uh, get what's called uh, tickets for distributing Holy Communion. So basically, you get to stand near the altar uh, of a papal Mass 
And the Pope actually consecrates the, the bread that you're holding in your hands, and then you help distribute communion. And if you studied things like I did, you could arrange always to be in the front row closest to the Pope every time that there was a papal mass. And so I, this was the way I did it. So uh, there was actually, there was a, a beatification that happened in the fall of 2004. So this is about six months before St. John Paul II died. And to be honest, I have no memory of which saint was being beatified or canonized that day, because I was there to see St. John Paul II. <laughs> and, uh, but he was too old at this point and too frail to be able to actually preside at the Mass. So he was present. He presided over the Liturgy of the Word. He delivered the homily. But then they parked him on the side where there was a pray -do, and uh, he had the, the, really the nicest wheelchair you've probably ever seen. It was a papal wheelchair, you know, that he would roll around in. And there was a cardinal who would come to the altar and celebrate the Mass. Uh, and there I was at this Mass, and I was right in the front row. I was probably from me to Bishop Folder, maybe 20 feet from St. John Paul II. And, uh, and I was watching him during the celebration of the Mass. Well, we got to the point in the Mass where the people would kneel right at the end of the Sanctus. And the Holy Father was very frail, and he was in his chair, but he singled, signaled to the two masters of ceremonies next to him that he wanted to kneel. And one of the, you could see one of the papal master of ceremonies put his, head on, his hand on his shoulder and say, it's okay, Holy Father, you stay seated. And John Paul II, he pushed his hand away, <laughs> and he said, I want to kneel. And so these two masters of ceremonies, they lifted him out of his chair, really his wheelchair, right? And they placed him on this pray -do that was in front of him. And you could see the pain in his face. And he stayed that way, of course, all the way through the Eucharist and the consecration, right? And as I saw this, I thought to myself, I'm seeing the Mass. Here's St. John Paul II in his great love for our Lord and his great love for the church, who's willing to suffer for the sake of the salvation of the world. And who at that mass is uniting his own suffering to the mass for the sake of the salvation of the world. This is really what it means to live a Eucharistic life. And this is the power of what the Eucharist wants to do in us. The Eucharist is more than just an encounter with love. It is that. But it's love freely given that demands from you and me a response of love, a desire to make a gift of love, which even means, especially in our world today, a willingness to embrace suffering and difficulty for the sake of love. Pope Benedict spoke about this in his very first encyclical on, the, on love. And he said this, the Eucharist draws us into Jesus' act of self-oblation. But more than just statically receiving the incarnate logos, we enter into the very dynamic of his self-giving. So more than just receiving the gift of his love, I'm actually supposed to learn how to make a gift of myself in love. How to offer myself in love. Now here it's important to understand why the Mass is different than any other prayer that we could offer. The reason is because Holy Mass is not just my prayer or your prayer or the priest's prayer or the bishop's prayer. It's Jesus' prayer. In fact, Holy Mass is the one perfect prayer, the one perfect worship that has ever been offered in the history of the world. It's important to understand what was happening on the cross. What was happening on the cross was an act of worship. What was Jesus doing on the cross? Well, he told us the night before, this is my body given up for you. This is my blood poured out for you. Why was it that the temple curtain was torn in two when Jesus died upon the cross? Because the temple where God had dwelt and where all worship had happened was ended. Because Jesus, when he died on the cross, as the book of Hebrews says, entered the one true tabernacle in heaven. And there 
He brought before the Father, as it says in Hebrews, the blood which speaks more eloquently than that of Abel. Do you remember what Abel's blood said? Abel, Cain, when he slew Abel, God said to Cain, your brother's blood cries out to me for vengeance. What did Jesus' blood say when he brought it before the Father? Of course, it cried out for mercy. For mercy for all of humanity. That all of us who receive his body and blood would receive his mercy. Jesus' death on the cross in this way is an act of worship. And of course, it's intimately united with what happened at the Last Supper, right? In fact, those words at the Last Supper, they wouldn't even make sense without his death on the cross. This is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for you. And the cross, it wouldn't be an act of worship if it wasn't tied to the Passover meal where Jesus pours out his body and pours out his blood for us. And of course, all of that would be empty if it wasn't for the resurrection. It's the resurrection that makes this passage through the Last Supper, through death, a passage to eternal life, not just for Jesus, but for all of us who participate in it. And so those three events, the Last Supper, the cross, the resurrection, we talk about that as one mystery. We call it the Paschal mystery. It's our Passover. Just as the Passover saved the Jewish people from slavery in Egypt and made them God's people, so through this event, we are made God's people. And that covenant which he makes with us is renewed every time we celebrate Holy Mass. And every time we receive Holy Communion. Every time we say, Amen. What does that word mean, Amen. It's why we don't translate it. It's a Hebrew word. It's a covenantal word. It means too many things to translate. It means I believe. It means let it be done to me. It means I want to be part of this covenant, right? It means I want to live, give my life for you just as you have given your life for me. And because we receive, we're in fact called to live the way Jesus lived, right? Just so you don't think I'm making this up, I'll quote you the catechism. When this hour comes, he lives the unique event of history which does not pass away. Jesus died, is buried, and rises from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father once for all. That's a historical event that happened in time. His Paschal mystery is a real event that occurred in history, but it is unique. All other historical events happen once and then pass away, swallowed up in the past. The Paschal mystery of Christ by contrast, cannot remain only in the past because by his death, he destroyed death and all that Christ is, all that he did and suffered for all men participates in the divine eternity and so transcends all times while being made present in them all. The event of the cross and resurrection abides and draws everything towards life. What Jesus is doing in the Eucharist is inviting us to participate and live his Paschal mystery. To learn to make a gift of our own lives. Let me give you another example of this. What was Our Lady doing at the foot of the cross? Why is she there? We just celebrated that feast, a beautiful feast of our Mother of Sorrows a couple of weeks ago. And what was Mary doing there at the foot of the cross? Why was she there? There were lots of people at the foot of the cross doing different things. Some were mocking Jesus. Some were there out of curiosity. They were spectators. But what was Mary doing? Well, of course, she was offering. She was consenting to the death of her son. She was once again saying, let it be done. Let it be done to me according to your will. And as she was saying that, she was offering her own life with Jesus to the Father. Now remember I said there, there really has been only one perfect act of worship in the history of the world. And that was the offering that Jesus made on the cross. Why was it perfect? Because, of course, he's both fully human and fully God. 
And he offers everything that he is on the cross to the Father. And so when Mary participates in that, what happens? Well, her own suffering. The Father said she's a martyr. The Father's of the church said she's a martyr there at the foot of the cross, right? Because the sword of sorrow is piercing her heart. And her own death that she endures emotionally and spiritually, she unites to Jesus' death. Even Our Lady's sacrifice without Jesus would mean nothing. But united to Jesus, what does it mean? Well, it means that she cooperates in the birth of all the souls that come from this event. You see, uh, the fathers of the church often spoke about the cross as a marriage. And we know that the covenant we share with God is a marriage covenant, right? We become one flesh with him through the Eucharist. A marriage requires mutual consent, though, right? Mary was there saying yes on your behalf and on my behalf. And therefore, she participated in the birth of the church that would come from that cross. Which is why Jesus looks at her at that moment and says, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Because by her participation, she participates in giving birth to all the children of the church. And so she is our mother. Now here's the point. What are you and I supposed to be doing at Holy Mass? If Holy Mass is representing what happens, in fact, at Calvary in a sacramental way, and the Paschal mystery is being present to us, are we there as distracted bystanders? Curiosity? Are we there simply to receive, just to be fed or entertained? All that's true. It's helpful when I receive. I like it when there's a good homily too, right? But why am I really there? What really happens? Well, I'm there to offer worship to God. Not my worship, but I'm there to unite my worship to the worship of the one true God. The worship of the Son who gives himself to the Father. And so I'm supposed to learn to bring my life, my whole life, to this altar. We pray this at Mass, but sometimes we don't think about these words we say. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Well, what's your sacrifice? What is it? Is it the struggle that you're having in your family right now? Is it the difficulty, financial difficulties, health difficulties? It is, it, is it the concern that you have for your family members who are away from the church? What is your sacrifice that you're called to bring here? In our, in our faith, we have this saying, and I, I, as a kid, I hated this saying. It's, uh, the, the saying is, offer it up. <laughs> and I hated it because my mom would say it to me, and then it meant I couldn't complain anymore. And, of course, I liked to complain. And so it was, I didn't like the fact that when she would say, offer it up, I just had to be quiet. But that saying, what does it actually mean? What are we saying when we say, offer it up? What we're saying is this. You have some particular pain in your heart, some particular pain in your body, some suffering that you're going through, emotional, spiritual, physical. And instead of just wallowing that, like I'm tempted to do, every time I have suffering, I'm tempted to turn it on myself, right? Instead of doing that, what if you thought of another person in the world? Someone who's far from God, maybe someone who's suffering more than you, maybe the people in Ukraine who are experiencing a terrible war right now, maybe the, the, the children who are dying from abortion, whatever it might be, you think of those people and you say, you know what? I'm going to endure, accept this suffering willingly for their sake. So that it might make a difference for them. Now without the mass, that would be ridiculous. It just would. What possibly could my suffering here do anything for the people right now who are fleeing war in Ukraine? But if what happens at mass is true which is my little suffering that I'm going through right now, 
I bring it here, and at the offertory, I place it on the altar. And then that suffering becomes part of Jesus' great sacrifice, which is offered and taken up to the Father. And then it becomes part, as Mary's sacrifice did at the foot of the cross, part of the redemption of the world because I'm cooperating. Then, in fact, my little sacrifice takes on infinite value. And it begins to make a difference for the life of the world. This is exactly what St. Paul says when he says, In my own flesh, I make up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, that is, the church. What's lacking in the sufferings of Christ's body? Well, your sufferings. You're part of the body. And you need to bring those sufferings to mass and transform them into an offering. Brothers and sisters, do you see how this can change our life? Suffering's a part of our life. God wills it to be a part of our life. He allows it. He never wills evil. He never wills sin. But he doesn't end suffering in the world. Why? Because he wants suffering to be a way of love. And this is what the Eucharist wants to teach us. That if we will bring our sufferings here, they not empty but they can, in fact, be sources of grace for the world. In fact, St. John Paul II had said in his encyclical on suffering, suffering is the greatest source of grace for the world. Jesus is suffering and ours united to him. If we live this well, it can transform everything in our lives. Pope Benedict says it this way. There's nothing authentically human, our thoughts and affections, our words and deeds, that does not find in the sacrament of the Eucharist the form it needs to be lived to the full. There's nothing authentically human that if you bring it here to Mass, can't be transformed into a gift that you can give to God and can transform the world. Now, I don't say this lightly, but I do believe that this is the key to living a Eucharistic life. And I don't say it lightly because I know how difficult suffering is. And I know that many of you carry real sufferings. But there's a way to learn to transform every suffering into a gift. And that is learning to allow God to use it for his good. Now, of course, many times God wants to heal suffering wants to take it away, and it's certainly okay to ask him to take it away. Jesus himself did that, right, in the agony in the garden. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But Jesus also allowed that suffering to become a way of loving. just want to close with you with one simple story. This was a story uh, uh, through my time in Rome. I got to meet the missionaries of charity, Mother Teresa's sisters, and Several times they would invite me to give retreats or conferences for them. And once, a few times actually, they invited me up to Belgium to give some retreats. And I was invited to a place called Ghent, Belgium. And uh, Mother Teresa's sisters had a retreat house there. Uh, but the reason they were in Ghent, Belgium was because of a man named Fernand. So what happened was uh, Mother Teresa went to Ghent to give a talk to the people at a conference probably like this. And and the bishop said to Mother Teresa, would you please send some of your sisters to stay here? And Mother said, well, you don't really have that many poor people here, and we go where the poor are, and I don't know why I would send my sisters here. And he said, why don't you come meet Fernand? And so he took Mother Teresa to meet this man named Fernand, and Fernand was a paraplegic, so he could only move his head. He could talk just fine, but he couldn't move any other part of his body, except he could just squeeze his left thumb enough to press a button that would open the door on his one-room apartment if you would come and buzz the door, right? And uh, Mother Teresa came to visit him. Fernand, you see, he wanted to be a priest, and he was actually preparing to enter the seminary when he was in his 20s, and he came down with this strange disease that paralyzed him. I got to meet him through Mother Teresa's sisters. When I met him, he had been paralyzed for more than 50 years. He had been in that bed for more than 50 years. And when Mother Teresa met him, she was very impressed by him, and uh, actually, she began to realize that, that he was a suffering soul. He was a soul that was given suffering for the sake of the world. 
And uh, in fact, while they were conversing, one of the co-workers said, uh, Fernand, there's no crucifix in your room. Why don't you have a crucifix? And Mother Teresa got a little upset with the co-worker. And she said, don't you understand? He's the crucifix. And it turned out Fernand does have a crucifix, and he keeps it on his chest, just between his arms. And he keeps it there as a reminder of what his suffering is for. And when I went there to celebrate Mass with him, I, I came with the, some of the sisters, and we sat up the table in his room to celebrate Holy Mass there. And the sisters, they took that crucifix off of his chest, and they put it on the altar, which we used for Mass. And I thought to myself, what a great image. Here's all of Fernand's sufferings poured into this crucifix and now placed on the altar and offered with Jesus's to the Father for the salvation of the world. Now, Fernand was a, a very joyful man. In fact, the sisters would say if, you, if they were having a bad day, they'd go see Fernand because he would cheer them up. And Fernand would often speak about the joy that he had and the gift of his life. In fact, when I came to meet him the second time, I walked in, I said, hello, Fernand. He said, oh, Father Andrew, I've been praying for you. I said, thank you, Fernand. He said, that's my work. That's what I do. So a few times I got to visit him and to celebrate Mass for him. And the last time that I did, I had just finished celebrating Mass and had given him Holy Communion. And we were sitting there in silence after Mass. And then he said these words to me, which continually ring in my ears. He said this. He said, I'm just a man with all my weakness, but I'm burning with love. I'm just a man with all my weakness, but I'm burning with love. And, you know, to be honest, I thought to myself that I was before the burning bush. That fire that burns, that doesn't consume. And then I thought of how the heart of Jesus is always portrayed that way, how it's on fire, right? And I thought, you know, Fernand wasn't always this way. I'm sure in the beginning when he was paralyzed, there were many long, lonely nights where in the midst of his suffering, he cried out to God and said, God, why would you allow this? But gradually he began to learn that Jesus was with him and that this was suffering was his way of being with Jesus. And it transformed him, and it set him on fire with love. And everybody who encountered him encountered that love. Brothers and sisters, if we live Eucharistic lives, this is what will happen to us. Our sufferings, they won't take us away from God. Our difficulties and struggles, they'll actually draw us closer to him. And if we can learn to transform them by bringing them here to the Mass, then he'll set our hearts on fire with his love. And then everyone who encounters us will encounter that love. So let's beg for that same grace that we might be able to say with Fernand, I'm just a man with all my weakness, but I'm burning with love. Thank you very much.